Hello, my name is Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz, and I'm very excited to share with you uh, this video on basically the proper steps to do an occlusal analysis trial equilibration that is going to lead into diagnosis on a complicated case. This particular patient has uh, joint pain, and uh, so so basically. The intention or the objectives of this video is to observe a live patient occlusal examination. And uh, then, then after that, we're going to look at a trial equilibration and, and kind of like wrap the entire case together. So we, we have, we kind of understand the sequence of a diagnosis of a patient uh, of a patient that has, um, you know, has occlusal disease and in this particular patient pain. So... Uh, of course, just to, to remember, we would do it, you know, before this point, we would do an initial examination. So we met our patient, we did a comprehensive examination. The comprehensive examination would have to include a diagnosis of caries. We have to include a diagnosis of periodontal disease. And of course, at this point, we talked about the patient about occlusal disease. And we see that the patient has damage in their teeth. Maybe they have any of the signs and symptoms of occlusal disease, the seven signs and symptoms of occlusal disease. For more information on that initial diagnosis, please uh, view our, our other videos or any of our workshops. So the first stage of the occlusal disease management system is to discover and educate our patients. So this, so now we have educated our patients about the signs and symptoms. So most, many of our patients are not even aware that there is, uh, that they had occlusal disease. They don't know that headaches are caused by occlusal disease. They don't know that that um, uh, sensitivity, the primary source is occlusal disease. They don't know that their teeth could be loose because of occlusal disease, et cetera, et cetera. So now they have discovered their occlusal disease is more than just, more than just where. We educate the patient. We tell them the importance of, of managing occlusal disease, how it's a, a disease that is just going to continue to get worse and, and damage permanently their teeth. So once that occurs, then we can uh, talk, our talk to our patients about the importance and the need to move to the second stage. And only the patients, are, you know, that they the care, they want to do, and then they're willing to pay for an occlusal analysis We'll, we'll move into stage two. And the stage two is basically mounted cast, an occlusal analysis, and, and then developing a proper diagnosis that will lead to the, the, the appropriate treatment, the, the more minimally invasive treatment that we can do to our patient to, to, to stabilize their occlusal condition and, 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 and put them in a better place. So that's the, the second stage. And, and, and we don't mount cast on every single patient because not all the patients want to do that. Even if they really need it, not all the patients want to. And by the way, a lot of patients don't need it. They don't need to have uh, mounted cast. Some people don't have, you know, percentage of patients don't have occlusal disease or their occlusal disease is so mild and just, that just a night guard is enough. Now we're going to have our entire team help us with uh, taking the necessary records for our occlusal analysis. So the first step of that visit is to take the necessary records, and those records include photographs. Usually I like to have a panorex taken, uh, alginet or silicone impressions of the patient's dentition so we can mount those casts, uh, a prelim preliminary facebook, which is to be checked by the dentist, and the facebook is indispensable for for proper mounting uh, for for cases, and uh, then then a Lucia jig. The patient will have a Lucia jig as a deprogrammer in preparation for me uh, taking a, a CR bite, and also the patient during this time while the patient is deprogramming, that they usually deprogram for about twenty minutes they will also be filling up uh, the, the occlusal and TMJ form. So all of that is done by the dental assistants. It takes about, you know, 30 to 40 minutes of the dental assistant time, and that's why it's called team-driven. The benefit of the assistants taking all these records is that frees me up to do, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of other things. I mean, prepping veneers or onlays or whatever I'm going to be doing that day while the assistants are taking the records, educating the patient, of course, which is very, very important. And then after the patient, after the assistant took the necessary records, then I will do my part. I walk into the room and I tell the patient that it's going to be my turn to take, uh, uh, to use 
you know, some techniques to allow me to evaluate their occlusal condition. And um, so we're going to go ahead and view those those steps on a, actually on a live patient. So, uh, you know, we will you be using by manual manipulation to do load testing, to find the first point of contact, to to view the occlusal slide. Then, uh, then of course, we're going to check for guidance. Uh, we're going to measure range of motion. And, and, and then we're going to listen for TMJ noises. Uh, we're going to check for fremitus sensitivity. We're going to check for CDH, cervical dental hypersensitivity. And then we will uh, do the, the rest of the analysis using the mounted cast. Hi, Melissa. I know we already been taking the necessary records. Nicholas has taken the impressions and the photographs. And now it's time for us to do the occlusal examination. So during, during the time that you were wearing your, your uh, anterior deprogrammer, this little plastic thing that you have in your mouth, you've been filling, you filled up this form. So I want to ask you a couple of questions in regards to that and uh, to make sure that we're very clear on, on some of the symptoms that you have had and for how long you have had it, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'll be asking you these questions in, in, in just a few minutes. <laughs> First thing that we're going to do is we're going to position your 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 joint in the in its ideal place, which we call CR. And we're gonna do that by gently positioning your jaw there. So what now that, that you've been deprogramming your, your muscles will be a little bit more relaxed. I'm gonna sit you back a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and and, and help your your joint to get, it, get in its right place. I'm going to sit you back a tiny bit more. Okay. 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 So, the, I'm going to take the deprogrammer out. And the only thing you, I need you to do is just relax your jaw as much as you can. And as a matter of fact, I want your whole body to relax. Relax your arms. Relax your whole body. And just try to let me gently position your jaw in its right place and out open and close your teeth okay so you don't have to do anything at all as a matter of fact you're being wonderful right now I can feel that I have I have in the right place and now what I'm gonna ask you to do is is I'm gonna ask you to tell me if you feel any discomfort as I'm putting some pressure upward pressure towards your joint in this direction do you feel any discomfort on either side no I'm going to do a little bit with a little more force this time. Again, do you feel any discomfort at all? This time you felt side. a little bit on this side, on the left side. Okay, with this slightly more pressure, you felt it a little bit more. Okay, one more time, a little relax. You know, we have it in the right place. Now I'm applying more force. How about this time? Uh, all sides. This time on both sides. So with more pressure, you feel discomfort on both sides. So that's interesting. That with light pressure, there was no discomfort. With medium pressure, there was discomfort on the left. And with the strong pressure, you feel discomfort on both sides. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to find the first point of contact. And for that, I need a cut, I need a cut and roll too. I need two cut and rolls. Because for, for the paper to mark, teeth have to be very dry. I don't want any saliva right here. Okay, perfect. So just stay, just stay uh, open for me. And uh, okay, now one more time, relax your jaw. Just do what you were doing it just a couple of minutes ago. Beautiful, beautiful. Relax it as much as you can. Open a tiny bit, just like that. Just like that. Okay, just okay, you're doing really good right now. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. Now go ahead and put the paper in here. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and count it close. Okay, now put it on the other side. Okay, and let me see it in here. In the light. Okay. Okay, I see the first point of contact seems to be in the right side. Where, where do you feel that, that you, you touch first? 
just point at it, okay, here, in this area. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna do this one more time, I'm gonna confirm, which is where I saw also on the paper. Let's, let's see it here. Let's see this one more time. Put the paper in for me. And the right side one. Yeah, either one, either size, huh? And the last one, you're doing great. Just like that. The other side. Do you feel that you hit on the same side this time? Mm -hmm. You also feel hitting on the on the on the right. Okay, open a tiny bit more for me. Yes, yes. I see actually multiple points of contact. I see uh, the the right here. Like put place put contact on num on teeth on tooth number. On the lingual of tooth number two, and on the mesial, mesial number five, you didn't feel initial con initial contact on this side. You felt a little bit on this side. Mm -hmm. No, no, don't cross, don't cross. Mm -hmm. If you if you close, then then the the, the deprogramming stops working. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and in. Um, Put the paper one more time. Open a tiny bit for me. One more time. Okay, very good. In, in this particular case, I know I know that the, her bite is very very close. There's not a lot of there is not a lot of difference between CR and C in CO. Mm -hmm. I see a much bigger mark on the, um, which I also notice, you know, on tooth number um, number thirteen, on the mesial, on the so, so mark those three down. So fifteen, I mean two, five, and thirteen. Thirteen on the mesial bridge. Mesial bridge. Okay. Go ahead and do that your job for me, and I'm going to go ahead and help you close. Okay, so... Uh, okay, okay uh, nice. Now the moment that you, the first point, the first moment that you feel any tooth contact, then hold your teeth right there. Okay, now squeeze. Okay. Let's do this one more time. Just The moment that you feel the first contact, you hold it right there. Okay, good. Now squeeze. All right, open. So there is no, I don't really see any, any visible slide. So it's very, pretty much, we're pretty close to central being into the ideal place. Now let's go ahead and take that, that bite. Good. So in this case, centric and CR are almost in the same place. Okay. Still gonna guide her. So. Okay. This is gonna take about thirty seconds. Usually, after I wait for the material to set, I will try the bite at least two more times. I will leave the bite in the mouth, and I will manipulate and make sure that the, the, the teeth go straight into the teeth without any deflection. This confirms that the bite is accurate, that I do have the ability to repeat the position of CR and bring the teeth back into the bite every time without any deflections. In this particular case you will not see me do that because this patient CR and CO were practically in the same place. So I, I I didn't see any slides, and so in this case there was there was no need for me to do that. But in the great majority of times, I I I have to check the bite uh, a couple of times to make sure that that's a good bite. All right, open. Okay, perfect. So this bite. Okay, good. All right. 
So now let's go ahead and the, do the next step, which is to measure the, the opening, the maximum opening. So just open as much as you can. Okay, that's 45. Okay. Now you can close. Close your teeth together normal. And now slide your teeth as much as you can to to the right. Hey, perfect. And that that shows an eight millimeter. You have any discomfort when you do that? Mm -hmm. You have discomfort where? Show me where. On the left, on the right side. Okay, go into the middle. Okay, and go to the. We're recording all of this in the paper. Go to the other side. Perfect. That was at also eight millimeters. Do you have discomfort on that? Mm -hmm. You also have discomfort on that. Okay, go to the middle. Okay, good, perfect. That's very, very good. Thank you so much. Now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to listen to your. We're going to listen to your. Um, your joint. So now I will need to close again. Okay. Now open and close for me. Close. Open. Close. There is crepitus on the on the right. Open and close. Open. Close. There is a there is a click and crepitus on the left. Crepitus is actually, what it means is there's a little grinding sound on your joint. Oh, thank you. You already have gloves for me. You're, you're good. Thank you so much. What I need you to do for me is look at me. What you're going to do is you're going to slide your teeth and you're going to get until the point where your canines are touching like this. And exactly. And then you're going to do the same thing on the other side. Okay? So you're going to slide your teeth from the middle, and you're going to slide, go back in the middle, and do it slowly for me. Slowly, keep going. Okay, go back to the middle. Go back to the middle. Good. So there is actually, there is an interference on tooth number, tooth number five. Do it again. Yeah, there might be even an interference in the molar. Perfect. So we don't have full pain and guidance on the... On the on the right, turn towards me. And we're gonna do the same thing in this side. Please go ahead and slide. Okay, perfect. Back in the middle for me. Do it again. Yeah, there's also interference on this side. There's an interference. So there's there's an interference on tooth number. Very very noticeable interference on tooth number thirteen. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, now. Go ahead and slide your teeth forward and put it end to end and stay right there, stay where you are. There's no apparent interference in this area, so we seem to be okay. Go ahead, put back back in the middle. Okay. So now the next thing that we're gonna do is Nicholas is gonna remind me and it's Fremitus. Okay. So now we're gonna check for mobility. So go ahead and just open open and close for me. Okay. Keep going. There's a little Fremitus on tooth number seven. Just put seven. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going, keep going. And also Fremitus on tooth number 12. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, and the next thing is... Hypersensitivity. We gotta do mobility really quick. Just real quick to see if we see any, any is particularly mobile tooth. We already have mobility when we did period charting. I just want to confirm it, so I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna tell you if I see anything that is more mobile than 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 it should be. Uh, actually, she has very nice, healthy teeth. No mobilities anywhere. Very yeah, interesting. All right, good. Now the last thing that we're gonna do clinically is we're gonna do a an air test. And if you feel sensitivity in any of your teeth, you tell me, okay? I'm not just gonna blow a little tiny puff of air for a, for a second. And if you feel sensitivity, you just say, you just, you know, raise up your hand or, or, or make it sound. Sensitivity on tooth number 
the 24 20 26 all right do you do you know that you have sensitivity? Do, can you can you eat ice cream and stuff like that normally? I do have sensitivity. You know you have mm -hmm. sensitivity. Okay. Good. Well, that's it. That's that's all the tests. We're gonna study your models and we will let you know uh, what is our plan of action. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. So as we said, uh, we gonna I'm gonna ask you a few questions about this this uh, form, so we can get a little history about your condition. So. Let's go ahead and, and start with question number one, which we you marked yes, and that's do you have frequent headaches? Yes. And and the question is, do do you have you noticed any pattern, any particular pattern? Um, they're always worse in the morning, um, but depending on um, tension or stress, sometimes I can feel them throughout the day. Okay, so if you. If it's, a, if it's a stressful day, you mm -hmm. might feel that at the end, including at the end of the day. Yes. Uh, how would you rate this pain if see, one being almost nothing and ten being excruciating and you cannot take it anymore? I would say probably a six. A six, okay. Now, question number two, and you, you also marked yes. Do you have pain around the jaw area? Yes. And which side? Both. Both, right and left. Mm -hmm. Okay, and same question, um, from 1 to, to 10, how does it feel in the right? Um, probably a 4. A 4 in the right, and how about in the left? Probably 4, but they're about the okay, same. Okay, so you're both 4. Okay. It's just tightness in my... It's mostly right. tightness. I'm going to follow up, I'm not going to follow up questions that you marked yet. So the, the next question is, do you have tired jaws? or jaw muscles and you feel that your muscles are tired yes. in other words and, the, and you mark that you, you have you feel that in the morning and in the evening yes okay. very good and the other question that you mark yes is that you have some sensitivity to cold and uh, does that mean that you can have a hard time drinking like having an ice cream yes mm -hmm. so I will mark that so you have some sensitivity to ice cream uh, so in other words, it is pretty, pretty, pretty sensitive. Have you noticed any particular areas, by the way, that, that is sensitive? Um, some on the right, and maybe one or two spots on the on left. left. So a few teeth on the right and a few mm -hmm. teeth. On, but you're not not very. You don't know exactly which. No. Teeth. Okay. Okay. The next question that you mark uh, yes is: Do you have clicking or popping on your jaw? And you feel you feel you mark you feel popping on yes. your jaw. Just I, both or, or what? Well, or? what happens is my ears get plugged up mm -hmm. and I have to open my jaw to unplug my ears. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know. I've been to an ENT and I know it's not my ears, so I'm just assuming it's my muscles. The, the right. Okay. All right. So both sides. And uh, and you notice, you say that you noticed this many years ago. Yes. Yeah. So um, the next question that you wrote, that you marked yes, is are you taking or have you taken any medication for this and you say you, you take it more Yes. Um, okay. Uh, then, do you have any difficulty chewing and you mark yes? If I, if it's something like sourdough rolls, anything like that where it requires heavy chewing. So, I, so in other words, chewy, chewy stuff bugs you? Yes. How about hard stuff? Can you buy it at an apple? I can buy it in an apple. It's just if I have to chew a long time, my muscles get tired. Get tired. Okay. Perfect. The next question that you mark yes is, are you aware of clenching? And you marked that you're aware of clenching. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and the other question is, do you think nervous tension affects your problem? And you mark yes. Or if you have caffeine. I notice that if I'm, if I'm nervous or I'm tense, or if I drink a lot of uh, coffee, mm -hmm. I notice tension in my jaw. Okay. And then the last question is, uh, question number 20 is, what are your main goals for the occlusal and TMJ treatment? And your your answer was to relieve uh, some headaches in, uh, in the jaw pain. So yes. At this point, we are finished with the clinic sem clinical examination and the review of the questionnaire. After we finish our occlusal analysis, th then we're going to 
start developing a final desktop diagnosis. The patient went home. We told the patient that we have all the necessary records. We're going to prepare we're going to prepare a diagnosis that's going to be very specific to their needs. And uh, so the patient goes home. We schedule them for a visit a few days later. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and with all this information, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start developing a plan. Of course, the dental assistants will mount uh, my, my, my case you know, with a, using the CR bite that I took on that visit. And, uh, and then with all this information, I'm going to start developing a final treatment plan. Of course, we need to have a properly mounted cast, and this is the responsibility of my dental assistants. I've trained them to, to do nice mountings using the face bow, and, uh, and then I will uh, evaluate uh, the cast. And the, 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 the steps that need to be evaluated is on the screen is evaluate the occlusal plane, including the Kerber P and Wilson, evaluate if the patient has open or close or, or cross bites, uh, uh, checking for for centric lateral interferences. Uh, in addition to that, we you know we look for the anatomy of the, the morphology of the teeth. If it's if the morphology is really unacceptable, that is going to interfere with the proper function, then we will have to change the morphology in certain teeth by either doing fillings or or or, or indirect restorations. Evaluate if the bite or the occlusion is close enough that we maybe would just a minimal invasive equilibration and maybe slightly additive or subtractive, we can achieve the 2D golden rules. If not, then we need to start considering a more extensive uh, um, treatment like full mouth rehabilitation or extensive rehabilitation and maybe even orthodontics. A lot of times we have cases where we have, when we're gonna do a mounted cast evaluation and after we evaluate the case, uh, we still it still looks very complicated. It still looks like we don't have the correct answers. So, I, and those are the cases where doing a trial equilibration becomes incredibly valuable. So, um, but maybe there are interference to centric that we don't know what's going to happen. We start grinding them away. Are we going to close the bite a great deal? Are we going to? How much are we going to have to grind on certain teeth in order to get uh, you know all the teeth to touch? Those are the answers that a trial equilibration will give us. Also, uh, sometimes a trial equilibration, when, when you know, we, it might be helpful, or in sometimes a wax up might be desirable. If we're gonna, if we decide that we're gonna change the shape of the teeth, we can also combine a trial equilibration with a wax up. So it really allows us to play with the patient's teeth in plaster figure things out, things out in plaster and from that point on then we can once we have those answers we can really give our patients uh, you know a good diagnosis is going to be very valuable the good news is our goal is always the same as you know we want to fulfill the three golden rules of occlusion which means then then when we're when we're doing our trial equilibration we want to we want uh, at the end we want to see that those three golden rules are fulfilled we want to get equal contacts throughout and centric. And of course, our casts are mounted and centric. We're no longer looking for tripodation. We're looking for cost to FOSA relationship. And um, we want to have our contacts uh, along the central grooves and along the, the working cusp, at the tip of the working cusp, and the front teeth touching as well. Uh, after we get equal contacts on all the teeth, then we start uh, evaluating if there's any canine guidance. Uh, usually, we will use a, a red articulating paper to go, uh, and we're going to check if there's any red outside of blue. Uh, then we know that there's that there's lateral interferences, and and we could you know build it with uh, with restorations, or we could you know maybe subtract and get rid of the interferences. So. A lot of times, it doesn't take more than just looking at the cast, like this two cast that you see in front of you, to realize that there's not gonna, there's not a chance that we're going to be able to get good canine guidance, because the teeth are badly worn out. Maybe we have maybe we have border to border bites, and these patients are not going to get anterior guidance and canine guidance. So, these are the cases where we're going to have to add. And, uh, you know, most of the times it's not necessary to actually do it on the cast, but sometimes we want to get the answer. 
sometimes we're wondering, well, how much do we have to add? And, and how, you know, we want, maybe we want to practice in the cast in order to go and do it in the mouth. So nothing wrong with doing a little quick, you know, grabbing a little bond and a little composite and building up a, a guidance to see what, what will it take for us to gain proper canine guidance. So we are, in fact, going to show you this in a, in a live video. So now we are spraying occlude on the cast. The purpose of spraying this this green occlude is to keep create a memory of uh, where we're going to be grinding during our trial equilibration. I tend to only equilibrate one cast because it makes it easier for me. Um, so we, I usually only equilibrate the, the maxillary cast. I, I am repositioning the incisal pin if you if you see there. And uh, I want to make sure that the incisor pin is not touching the, the table. So um, now the next step is going to be using our articulating paper. We're going to do the tap, tap motion. Tap, tap motion again. And we're going to observe what we have. And uh, in this particular case, you can see we have three big contacts and nothing else is touching. Um, so when I, only, when I have less than three contacts, I will completely erase the mark. So you will see me completely erase the mark because that means that they're very high and uh, because nothing else is touching. Uh, later on, as we start getting more and more teeth in contact, I will not erase them fully. Why not? Because if I erase the contact fully and most other teeth are touching, then maybe I will not be able to regain contact on that tooth, and then we go round and round. So uh, with less than four contacts, fully raise it. With uh, once we start picking up multiple teeth, then then instead of fully raising it, I just remove the the part of the contact that is undesirable. Remember, the goal is to have contacts on the tip of the cusp and on the central groups. So anything along the, the slopes is undesirable or in the non-working cusp is undesirable. So any, the, the, the part of the mark that is closest to the desirable position, that's what's going to be preserved. At this point, if you see, I'm still, I'm still um, pretty, you know, we're still pretty high on a couple of spots. I mean, that, that bicuspid obviously was one of the primary interferences to centric. So, um, so that, that one has to be completely erased. And now we're starting to pick up minor contacts in other places. And, uh, and, and we, you know, we're, we're, you know, erasing them fully still. But uh, pretty soon we're going to get into the, into the part of the equilibration where we're truly just adjusting, just making the mark smaller and preserving the part of the mark that is closest to the desirable place. So um, we continue to to remove the contacts. Uh, if it if it's high, if it if we if we if we only have a few contacts and they're very heavy, then again we will erase them fully. So this is this is the this is the case right now. We're erasing it fully. Of course, we're not grinding a great deal. We're just grinding enough to to barely erase the mark. And as you will see, little by little, we'll, we will start picking up more and more marks. Now, as, as, at this point, you see we have already picked up a, a mark on the, on the first uh, uh, left molar. And, uh, but we still haven't picked up any marks on the right molar. And we're still very heavy on the bicuspid and in, in the second molar. So we are, now we're starting to, we're still, you know, almost erasing them completely. Um, I'm being a little more thorough than usual for this video, but in, if I was doing a trial equilibration, I would I wouldn't be quite as accurate. I wouldn't. I mean, if I was doing a trial equilibration on a regular case when I'm doing it in my office, I tend to just be a little more aggressive. I don't want to spend more than on a trial equilibration. I don't want to spend more than than you know three four minutes. I want to see what it what what's gonna take to to get. The, all the teeth or most of the teeth to touch in centric. 
That's really the purpose of the trial equilibration. The primary purpose is just to find out what is, how much do I have to grind on what teeth in order to get as many teeth to touch. And then from there, I can develop a treatment plan. What am I going to do with the rest? Now, as you can see in this particular situation, I'm, I'm almost have all the posterior teeth touching. And uh, so now I'm not completely erasing the marks. I'm actually just making them smaller and, and smaller and try to preserve the part of the mark that is closest to the ideal anatomical position. The ideal anatomical position, again, is the tip of the cusp and the central grooves. So, um, you know, as you can see, I'm still leaving a little part of the mark there. So I'm not erasing the mark fully. So again, and for for the sake of this educational video, I'm 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 being a little more comprehensive than I usually would be. But now you see that I have pretty much a contact on every single posterior tooth. I'm I'm um, I'm trying to get them to get them as as ideal as possible. Again, again, um, try not to trying not to erase the contacts fully but just making them smaller and keeping only the part of the contact that that is most valuable for me if it's if a contact is on a slope we can erase it completely and then preserve the the, the part of the contact that's closest to the tip of the cusp and this is closest to the central grooves we continue to to mark with the blue paper. If the blue paper starts getting a little bit beat up, then then we should you know con consider using uh, a new blue paper. And now you can see that we have you know contacts pretty much everywhere in the in the posterior area of the mouth. That would be you know that would make me very happy. Now, what I'm trying to figure out now is why is it that I don't have contacts in the front. I'm not going to keep grinding the back teeth forever if, if I can see, as you can see right there, that the anterior teeth are nowhere close to touching. If that's the case, then I have to go to plan B. I cannot continue to grind the back teeth. I will just grind the back teeth until I get all the back teeth to touch, and then maybe I need to do additive uh, uh, on the front teeth if that can work out for you know as part of my treatment plan. As you saw right now, I removed I removed the central the central lock. The central lock are those 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 gray um, uh, you know tools that are right behind the condyle or the articulator. And uh, after I release them, then it allows the articulator to move sideways. Using the red articulating paper, I'm I'm develop finding out uh, you know. The inner finding out the lateral interferences and seeing how severe they are, and um, you know this is going to allow me to make decisions whether I think that that I could possibly just equilibrate them away and then make sure that there's no red outside of blue, or if if the best direction in this particular case is going to be to add to do additive equilibration. Now I can tell you the answer pretty much is already or is already clear to me. This is going to be additive equilibration because, uh, you know, there was as you saw there was clearly no contact in the anterior area of the mouth. So adding a little composite in the front is actually helpful. So also again just a little bit for us an educational uh, component of this. I want to just show you. Um, the technique of what I w when I would do a composite guidance just to see, you know, what what is it going to take? How much composite is it going to take for me to get uh, guidance on those posterior teeth? So, um, so I'm basically placing a little um, a little line of composite. I'm 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 going to be building a palatal ridge. That's basically what a canine guidance is. Is the rebuilding of the palatal ridge. And um, I placed the composite in the area, in the place where I consider, I'm not gonna open the vertical dimension, obviously, so I'm placing the composite in the part of, you know, in that, in that space that is gonna be, um, that is gonna be between the, 
the mandibular bicuspid and the mandibular uh, canine. So um, you see me shaping it. And it, it was fairly large amount of composite because the space was quite large. Uh, now placing a little in in the mouth, I will be I will put saliva, and the in the in the cast, I'm putting Vaseline as a separator, because before I cure, I'm gonna I'm gonna have the patient bite, or I'm gonna have the articulator close together, so I don't create a a huge interfer centric interference. I don't I you know, and I don't want to spend a huge amount of time trying to uh, adjust it later, and after I have that that mark on the on the on the uh, soft composite now the last thing I'm going to do is just reshape it give it the final the final proper shape maybe taking some of that excess that I had originally and um, make it a little bit nicer <coughs> and then we, then uh, then we will cure and um, and as you will see in just a second that little bit of composite is going to give us a tremendous amount of separation on on the, you know, for our canine for our guidance. So um, now the tip of the the canine it looks a little pointy right now. I would go back if it was a patient. I would go back with a soft like this and shape it up to look more like a real canine, because. The separation doesn't happen at the tip of the canine. The separation, the, the guidance happens immediately and it happens on the lingual surface of the canine on that palatal ridge that we created. After the cast, you know, after we did the trial equilibration and, and now we have a lot of information about this particular case, now we can develop our treatment plan. So we have a tremendous amount of, of data at this point. Remember we did a, the, you know, we gather information on the form. We did a, an occlusal analysis. Now we did the, the trial equilibration. We know, we know our goal. We also ask the patient, what are their goals? What do they want to achieve from this occlusal analysis? We understand the signs and symptoms that the patients have. We know that our goal is to fulfill the three golden rules of occlusion. So we have a tremendous amount of information that now we're going to put together in order to develop a treatment plan for our patient. So with that, you know, we're going to write it down. We're going we're gonna to write down exactly what we think that we need to do to basically fulfill the three golden rules of occlusion, to give our patient a healthy bite. And if you want to learn more about the three golden rules of occlusion, we have a, a, a number of videos that will explain that in, in, in a lot of detail. So with that, with, us, with those three golden rules of occlusion, then we, we will develop a, a treatment plan that will be specifically to treat the occlusal component of the patient's problem. Now, if we are only treating occlusion, if we're only treating patient signs and symptoms of occlusal disease, then that might be enough. Now, if we are doing, if we're going to treat the occlusion as, as part of a global treatment plan, maybe veneers, maybe maybe a, a partial rehabilitation, then we will, we will use that information, that diagnosis, we will put that as part of that global treatment plan. Uh, at the LA Institute, we use the dentofacial aesthetic diagnosis form as our global treatment plan. So we will in, in, you know, infuse that information on that form, and then after that, we will create a complete, a complete treatment plan. Uh, before I present the treatment plan to my patients, I always want to develop, uh, have, have options. I don't, I don't, I don't ever want to present to a patient a treatment plan that is only one and that's it, because some patients need options. So I like to give the patient some, some, some options. And our form also allows us to develop a, a you know, treatment sequence. Once the patient says, this is the direction that I want to go, then we, we write down the treatment sequence. So then we know the number of appointments, what each appointment is going to take, how long is it going to take. And so the patient can start finding out and preparing for, for what's ahead of them. So that, this, you know, this video kind of gives us a quick review of the sequence that our diagnosis process will take. It goes from initial visit to you know, phase one of the occlusal disease management system, to record taking, to occlusal analysis, to mounted cast evaluation, uh, a, a, a trial equilibration, and with all this data, develop a treatment plan 
they will be either only for occlusal treatment or as part of a global treatment plan. Uh, I hope this video has been of value to you. Uh, of course, is, this is only part of a full series of, of, of additional information. And of course, you're welcome to ask questions on our forum or uh, uh, you know, acquire more, more videos or visit, take some of our workshops. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Have a great day.